that has endangered our communities. What do you mean, Pastor? It's this modern Christianity has endangered our communities, uh, amen, uh, and they have lacked on preaching on sin, hell, and repentance. Now we just preach about make me feel good. That's it. Preacher, make me feel good. Tell me all the blessings. Uh, amen. But don't tell me about hell or sin because it makes me feel bad. And I don't want to change it because, of, listen, I love God. But, you know, me and God got this understanding and I'll stay over here. God's over there. Yada, yada, yada. We lack preaching on sin, hell, and repentance. Mm. And then what it does when we lack to preach on these three topics that Jesus wasn't shy to speak on, it leaves people unchanged. And when it leaves people unchanged, there's no fear of God. And when there's no fear of God... People do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. And when they do whatever they want, they don't value life nor love their neighbor like Jesus commanded. You can, you can, that guarantees to follow. And Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. He didn't just say, tolerate your enemy. He says, love them, pray for them, feed them. Now that's a challenge, because how many know that ain't easy to love your and feed your neighbor? Mm -hmm. But Jesus is saying, listen, uh, love them, feed them, bless them. Uh, if they persecute you, pray for them. Anybody can say that, but to do that is another thing. That's what Jesus, the Bible says that Jesus died for his enemies. We're his enemies. The Bible says you and I were the enemies of Jesus on the cross. He died for the ungodly. Listen, don't get me wrong this morning. I'm not saying uh, as a Christian we need a Bible thump, your, your whole walk with God, you're going to hell, you're going to hell, you're going. I'm not saying, amen, I begin to be that type of Christian this morning. That's not what I'm saying. Don't get me twisted. We'll scare people off that way. Yep. But the truth is, my friend, that sin, this three-letter word, is destructive. This sin that you and I try to ignore or entertain, amen, listen, well, God will eventually have to judge it. Yep. Just like a father will eventually have to correct their child. Amen. You give them grace, you give them mercy, you love them, you nurture them, you take care of them, but eventually you're going to have to, you're going to have to correct it because if not, you're going to do them a disservice. This lovey-dovey, young and bear Christianity isn't going to help us. I'm not saying that God isn't love because that's his greatest feature. God is a God of love and grace, but if we're just preaching just love, grace, 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 what about repentance? John the Baptist told the Pharisees, you need to bear fruits worthy of repentance, man. That's where the Pharisees and Jesus collided. Second point this morning. Let's talk about the response of our cities. As a watchman, we are responsible to blow the trumpet. We have a huge responsibility that falls on our part as a Christian, as a believer. We are to warn people, listen, get saved, get ready. The rapture can come. At any moment, Christ can come for his church. You don't want to miss the rapture. Something that isn't being preached in Christianity today, churches, they don't believe in the rapture. Ah, oh, that's just a... Theology that's made up of no, biblical doctrine, my friend. You see, I, I actually spoke to our founder of our fellowship, Pastor Mitchell, who's been preaching now for 60 plus years, the founder of our fellowship, and I asked him this question on the topic of the rapture. And he said he has more and more witnessed many churches failing yeah. to preach on the rapture. On. He also said that it is one of the bases of our fellowship. What does basis mean? In other words, it is a fundamental principle a fundamental groundwork, a fundamental ingredient, right? It's like if you make enchiladas. How many of you enchiladas without cheese or tortillas? That's the fundamental ingredient. So the rapture is fundamental to our doctrine, amen. You cannot separate it from the content or the or from the, our biblical doctrine this morning. It's a standard. It's a fact which our Christianity rests upon. And today churches don't preach on this. They dismiss the whole end time thing. And there's a reason why it's there. There's a reason why Jesus dedicates a whole chapter in Matthew 24 and gives parables pertaining to that. Let's read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. These are famous scriptures that we believe why in the rapture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16 says, For the Lord himself will descend from, a, from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. Let me start again. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, 
and the dead will, and Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up, right, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. This is, amen, a scripture that we use, amen, this and that we believe that we'll be caught up, that God will take his church before this coming judgment on earth that the Bible speaks in Revelation. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 says, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless fallen, uh, the fallen away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship. So that he that uh, uh, so that he that sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, is talking about the Antichrist at that moment, will begin to reveal himself that he's God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things, and now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. But the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And the lawless one will be revealed. That's the Antichrist, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying, lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now think about that. God's warning us. Do not love the things of the world. Do not love, amen, the unrighteous things, the lust of the world. The Bible says that the only, there's only, the only thing that remains in the world is lust. You see, once Christ raptures the church, there's a coming judgment proclaimed on the earth that to the unbelieving generation as we read in this last scripture. And moreover, again, not only will there be literal hell on earth, but God will bring a judgment right at the beginning of his millennial reign on earth. Go to the book of Revelation. Book of Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. This is right here, right after the Antichrist is taken into power. There's much famine, war breaking out, bloodshed. There's a persecution of saints. Revelation 19, verse 11 says that his Christ coming back. He's actually come. Not only at this point, he's coming back. And I'll explain that in a minute. Verse 11 says, Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies of heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. By the way, that's the church coming back with Jesus. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. He himself will rule them with the rod of iron. He himself treads the white breast of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Now think about this. Again, it's referring to Jesus actually coming. And so there's a second coming of Christ. And if you get into eschatology or uh, Bible end time, there's two parts, amen, that's broken down to a second coming. The first is the rapture, amen, where God is in the, in the air, as we read in 1 Thessalonians, uh, and the saints are taking up the church uh, to meet with Christ, amen, and they enjoy what's called uh, a honeymoon. And the reason I say that because Jesus says that the church is his bride, and so he's preparing heaven, he's preparing the king's table, amen, and so you and I were in heaven rejoicing with our Savior, amen, eating at the king's table, we're in heaven, after those, uh, and after that, uh, the Bible goes on to describe the tribulation period, which is a literal seven years on earth of judgment, and right here where we read Revelation 19, it picks up on that, so after these seven years, Amen. Christ comes physically on earth. He puts his feet. And the Bible, this is where, this is the second part of the second coming. This is where Jesus actually sets his feet on the Mount of Olives in Israel. And he defeats the Antichrist and his armies, which they call the Battle of Armageddon. But you see, this coming, this coming of Christ is not, again, to die on a cross. But he's going to strike the nations, the Bible says. Cast judgment to the unbelieving world, those who rejected him 
over and over and over and over and over before he establishes his what's called the millennial kingdom we pray that prayer all the time lord uh, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven right thy kingdom come thy will be done one day that's going to be a literal uh, prayer answer that kingdom will come on earth and so at this time, if you're not right with Jesus, and if you missed the rapture, if you're still not right with Jesus, you don't you want to be right before you before God comes because yes. God's gonna bring judgment. The scripture says that he comes and wages war and righteousness. He brings a sword to strike the nations. We just read that. Other versions of that same scripture reads to strike down the nations, to defeat the nations. But wait a second, what's amazing, right? But is it in verse 15 it says, now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. This word, we just, isn't this word familiar? This whole time we've been in this service, we've been hearing the word sword. Isn't this word familiar? If you go back to Ezekiel 33, amen, uh, uh, back in verse 1 and 2, it talks about it, when I bring the sword upon the land. In other words, what it's saying is that God's going to bring this sword. This, this is a, this is a, 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 Amen. A form of judgment. It's pronouncing judgment. And this sword Christ brings isn't a physical sword. Amen. It's like whoosh, whoosh, ninja. But it's judgment. What he's talking about is his word. He's going to strike down the nation with his word just by speaking yep. in righteousness. How many of you know that if, if, if God, if the winds can obey God's voice, how many of you know that he can do anything with his voice? If he can say, let there be life, then there's life. If he says, strike, if you're dead, you're dead. You're dead. He's going to strike down the nation with his mouth. And that's what he does. That's what the Bible said that God uses when he comes to judge the nations and you and I in eternity. The sharp sword out of his mouth. The sword is his holy word according to the Bible. Hebrews 4 and 12. But the Bible, amen, is sharper than any two-edged sword. It warns the Christian when it comes to the full armor of God in Ephesians 6, 17, and put on the full armor of God, then it goes on to equip yourself with the sword of the spirit. You see, Christ will eventually bring judgment. Christ is going to judge our cities. Have mercy. For the sake of time, I'm not going to read it this morning, but in Matthew 11, Verse 20 to 24, you can read it on your own, Matthew 11, verse 20 to 24, Jesus says that there are cities that would not repent, even though he did miracles, amen, and he gives a warning, he says, listen, for those cities that don't repent, he says it's going to be more tolerable for the city of Sodom than for you. Think about that, Sodom is in the Old Testament, they got judged by fire and brimstone, and he's saying for those cities that do not repent, after the signs, the miracles, it's going to be more tolerable, he's giving you a comparison it's going to be more tolerable for Sodom than for you. That's out. Listen, church, we need to pray that our cities during this time of quarantine, it's not just a time of vacation, amen, it's a time to get right with Jesus, man, yeah. our creator who created us for righteousness, for relationship, for worship, for love, for truth, loving the brethren, amen. This whole, this politics, amen, pointing the finger at each other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so let's talk about quickly the right response for our city that our, our city should have. Because there's hope this morning. I'm not trying to sound all doom and gloom this morning. There's hope. There is a city that the Bible records where God himself does pronounce judgment if they don't repent, right? But when you read it, God spares this very city and saves them and brings blessing and revival. And that city is called the city of Nineveh. Jonah 3.10. Jonah 3.10 says, Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. God did not do it because they turned away from evil. The Bible says they believed in God. They fasted. They mourned. They repented from the king on down. Amen. Hallelujah. So how can we get this kind of response for our city? By speaking and preaching the very same message yes. that Jonah did. So let's examine it. Jonah 3.4. Jonah 3.4 says... Yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now, to you and I, what? I don't mean much. That doesn't mean that much, but let me give you a little bit of insight. He says, yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Three things I believe we can find in that simple text. You can read it again for yourself, Jonah 3, 4. But three things. Number one, it was simple. The Bible says that, listen, 
We're to never take the simplicity of the gospel. What does that mean? That who saves is Jesus. It's not you and I. We're just that watchman. We're just that messenger telling people, listen, give your life to Christ. As simple as that. It's not I who saves. I don't have the power to pardon sin. A priest does not have a part to, to, to listen, I don't know why I understand why people believe that. Right. Priest has no power to pardon sin. It's only Jesus. Right. I'll leave that one alone now, but Jesus saves, man. That's how simple it is. Number two, it was straightforward. Hey, man, you, you, need, you need to get right. We believe in what's called in an exclusive gospel. You know what exclusive means? That only Jesus is the way to heaven. There is no other way. I don't care what the what Islam says. I don't care what Judaism says. But Judaism doesn't believe in Jesus as their savior. Amen. I don't care what any religious Jesus is the only way. That's simple. John fourteen six. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Preach. You see the Pope. You read about him. Uh, he's aligning with these Muslim leaders for world peace and tolerance for Islam. And again, I'm not saying, uh, Amen, that we should hate Muslims. That's not what I'm saying, uh, Amen. But listen to me. I love my Muslim brothers. I'm going to tell them that Jesus died for you, bro. Yeah. He died for you. Atheist. He died for you. Skeptic. Yeah. He died for you. Cynic. He died for you. Black, white, Hispanic, uh, Central American, Canadian. He died for you. And he wants a relationship with you. I'm going to tell him the truth. They may spit at me. They may reject me. But listen, I'm going to tell them the truth. Amen. Silent to say there are people that don't want peace. I don't care what they say on the surface. They don't want peace. Some religions will keep you to convert to another religion. Or don't convert to theirs. And lastly, that we can find in Jonah's message, it was bold. Here's just one guy telling the king on down, repent. That means for Christians today, we need to be unashamed, not afraid to speak the truth with love, grace, discernment, and wisdom. Again, I'm not saying you're going to hell. No, we need to speak with, with, of course, with truth, but also with love. We want this type of response for our city. We don't want God to say, man, I can't even find 10 righteous people in our city. And God bring fire and bring stone. Lastly, real quickly this morning, we have to have a heart for our city. Yes. We got saved for a reason. Listen, earlier I said we are the messengers sent beforehand. The watchman got us placed to watch for signs for the sword that will come and, 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 take, and listen, bring judgment. Listen to me, Christian, this morning. If you're a believer in Jesus, you got saved for a reason. And it wasn't to keep it to yourself, but it was to share his amazing grace, his gospel, your testimony, his love, his grace, amen, his transforming power. I used to be, amen, uh, listen, I was, uh, I had my own addictions. And no, it wasn't drugs, I never really done drugs, but I had my own addictions. That I know that I brought into my marriage, had I stayed in those addictions, I would have destroyed my marriage. Had I stayed in those addictions, I would have destroyed my relationship with my children. And God touched me. Not a religion, not a denomination, but Jesus. Amen. We got saved for a time such as this to be used powerfully by God. Amen? Amen. Pastor Campbell, our leader in our fellowship, says the will of God has an address. You were saved at a time as this to be used. We need to link hearts. Amen. You call it this your church when you link hearts to see souls get saved. Yes. What are we doing to see souls get saved added to the kingdom? Yes. I ask you today, woman of God, man of God, disciple, does your heart burn and have a burden for the lost? Do you care that the world is going to hell, amen, by the handbasket? Do you care like Jesus cares for the lost, for the cities of the world? Because again, Jesus didn't come to make good moral people. He came to die for the lost, for sinners. That's you and I, church. Luke 19, 41 says, Now as he drew near, he saw the city, this is Jesus, and wept over it. Yeah. He wept over Jerusalem. I ask you, you weep for those who are lost. Yeah. Loved ones, friends, co-workers that don't know Christ. Or do we think, ah, somebody else would do it. That's pastor's job. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 14, We're the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. You see, God doesn't want you to hide what he gave you, no. freely gave you, what he died for you to have. You have the answer to these dying cities of the world. It's Jesus Christ. Can we intercede like Abraham, like he did for Sodom and Gomorrah? He didn't even know Sodom and Gomorrah. He didn't even know anybody but his own nephew and family that lived there, and he still interceded for this city. 
you don't understand, Pastor, these Americans, they're, they're evil. They're selfish. They're religious. They think they know it all. And I can give you a new splash. We thought we knew it all before we got saved. Yep. Yep, yep. Listen, God wants to do something in our cities and our families. Yeah. I believe God has placed each and every one of us strategically where we're at, whether your job, your community, the city, and so forth. You don't have to be somebody great to do something powerful for God. You just got to be a willing heart. Say, God, use my life. I want to be used for your kingdom, for your purpose. And Lord, I know you created him for a reason. Back to Paul Revere. Paul Revere wasn't a military commander who led thousands to a battle of victory. He wasn't the president of the United States. He was just a mere patriot, a soldier, who decided to be a watchman and save his fellow brethren. What about us? Can we have a heart? Can we be patriotic in a spiritual sense? Because one day, Jesus will come. And we had to tell people, Jesus is coming. Here's Paul Revere, British are coming. But well, listen, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. I close with this scripture, Luke 12, 37. Luke 12, 37 says, Blessed are those servants whom the master, who is Jesus, when he comes, will find watching. But surely I say to you that he will gird himself, have them sit down and eat, and will come and serve them. Think about that. Here's Jesus, he comes back, he finds a servant watching, and the master is well pleased. And the whole time, the, what the illustration is trying to tell us is that Jesus wants to dine with us. He wants to be involved in our lives. But some of us, we're playing games with God, religious games. We'll clock in church, the moment we leave the church, we clock out, ah, I did my duty. But God desires a relationship. Jesus is coming soon, church, he is our blessed hope. Amen, let's tell people about Jesus. Amen. If we have every head bowed and eyes closed, respect to the person next to you this morning. Again, for those who are watching online this morning, we apologize for the uh, difficulty, amen, the interruption, amen, but we thank you for tuning back in this morning. We're here this morning. Listen, I ask you this question. God brought you here with his grace and mercy. And the question is, my friend, we're all of us, we're, we're, either gonna, we're all going to pass on to eternity. Whether it's the rapture, it can happen any moment, today, tomorrow, a year, two years, five years from now, nobody knows. Or we can easily pass away. But we're promised one day we'll stand before the king of kings, the judge of judges. And the Bible says we'll either enter one of two places for eternity. Our soul, our body dies and decays, but our soul will go somewhere. Either the heaven for eternity or the hell, my friend. This is real. Hell, hell is a real place, but so is heaven. Hell doesn't have to be your eternal destination. Hell doesn't have to be for you. The Bible says that hell was created for the demons and Satan for disobeying God. But unfortunately, those who defy Jesus as Savior, those who don't want nothing to do with God will turn there as well. My friend, hell doesn't have to be your, your place to go to. You're here, you're not, you don't even know where you would go. You're here, amen, and you're not even sure, never thought about it that way. Man, if I do die, I'm not sure what I would go. Can I tell you that there's hope this morning? There's hope in Jesus Christ. Jesus, the Bible says, left heaven and all of its glory. He left where he was the king of kings that came down on earth, born through a virgin, became a man, died on the cross, sinless and perfect for your sins and my sins, my friend. And the only way to heaven, the only ticket to heaven is through him and him alone. Have you received the free gift of salvation? Have you received Christ as your Lord and Savior? Because my friend, that's the only way to make it to heaven. We're not good enough. I'm sorry, but we're not. It's why Jesus had to leave heaven and the perfect domain, the heavenly domain, the paradise, to die for us. Because we're not good enough, my friend. There's nothing that you and I can do that can amount to, amen, uh, uh, to merit salvation. Jesus had to die a horrible death for you and I. You're watching online. You don't know you would spend eternity. I encourage you. Give it out to Jesus. What are you waiting on? Don't play Russian roulette with your life. Jesus is calling to you with his grace, his mercy, his salvation. You're here this morning. Here this morning. You want to give it out to Christ. Raise your hand. Anybody in this place would say, I want to pray a prayer. Listen, we're not going to ask you nothing else. We're not here to embarrass nobody. We're not here to put nobody on the mic and spill their their, their beans or nothing like that. We're here to just simply pray with you. I would count it as a privilege to pray with you this morning. 
Maybe you're here and you're a backslider, amen. What that means, you were once involved in church and doing right, living for God. You were on fire for God. You loved God. And for some reason, something pulled you away. Maybe the world was calling back to you. Maybe it was an old flame. Maybe it was a temptation that you felt you never overcame and conquered. And it conquered you. And it pulled you back into the miry clay, into sin, my friend. And I ask you. Are you right with Jesus? Maybe right now you're not right with God. Back to the come back to Christ. Raise your hand this morning if that's you. God sees that hand. You're watching online. Listen, raise your hand. Uh, you want to pray this morning. We encourage you. God's faithful this morning. It's all about relationship this morning. It's all about relationship. It's all about relationship. Jesus died for you so you can make heaven your home this morning. You're watching online. If you're here this morning, sister, just repeat this prayer after me. Say, Dear Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for my sins, for giving your life for me, exchanging your free gift of salvation for my sins. Thank you for washing me white as snow because I was scarlet as red. But now, I'm a new creation, washed by your blood. Come into my heart. Become my personal Lord and Savior. I thank you, Jesus, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you pray that prayer, Jesus means, if you pray that prayer, listen, God means business with you. I encourage you to take a few moments right now and talk to God. We're going to open up the altar. You can find a place and talk to Jesus. You're watching online. You pray that prayer. Listen. Right? That, that's not the end of it. This is only the beginning. The beginning where Jesus, you invited him into your life, uh, into your heart. Uh, listen, now you start your walk with Christ. Now you're a new creation. Now you're forgiven. Now you make heaven your home. Begin to speak uh, and talk to God. Lay down your burdens, uh, whatever, perhaps addiction, bondages that have you found. Give them to Christ. He died on the cross for you to have victory and to claim it for your life. You don't have to go back to the world in that miracle, clay, that sin. You can stay in Jesus, uh, free and free indeed, uh, because Jesus sets you free, my friend. Father God, we thank you this morning for your blessing and grace. God, we thank you for those who made a decision to give their life to you, not to religion, not to the church, not to me, but to you, the living God, who sees every decision that is, Father, that was made unto you, God. Bless those, God, who are watching, who gave their life to you, Christ. I pray, meet with them, meet their needs, God. Have your way in their lives powerfully. Move and reassure them of your love, your grace, and mercy this morning. If you're still praying, don't let me rush you praying this morning. You're watching. If you're praying, don't let me rush you as well. For the rest of us, we're going to stand to our feet and sing this song. No turning back. No 
Father God, in the word and season, Father God, we thank you, Father God, for all the things you are doing, Father God, in our world in this time, Father God. We pray, Father God, that you will give us traveling grace and mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> 